Remember, the human skull consists of 22 bones, of which 8 bones form the neurocranium, that is the calcarium and the bascranium, or what you call the floor of the cranial or the neurocranium. Then there's what you call the visceral cranium, the lower part. So the, this upper part, this one here, the calvaria, part of neurocranium, develops by intramembranous association. But uh, this one here, the floor, or what you call the base cranium, develops by by endochondral association. But then when you come to the visceral skeleton, it develops by intramembranous association. We said the man, the let me start with the facial skeleton, develops by 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 what? Intermembranous association. We say that the mandible is the second bone after the clavicle it develops. It starts developing by week six, by week six, mainly from the first batch of cartilage, but the lingula, which is on the ramus in the middle surface, receives some contribution from the from the from Michael's cartilage, and then some occasional sheen or scores. I think the other thing also received from the from that Michael's cartilage, then the condyla from the Condyla cartilage, this area here, from condyla cartilage by week 10, which will fuse, will start growing, will grow until 20 25 years. To find, to find man, the demand was a bone when they are different, they are joined by the surfaces mating by just one year. I've said, as you see, the floor, eh? the, the, the roof, the roof is formed by intermembranous association. Eh? So you happen to see that, eh? okay, all of them are intermembranous. Eh? So this frontal bone appears to be born when the two are separated by what you call the metopic sexual. Fusion of bones at this fissure starts by year two, then ends by year seven. Then when you go to the occipital bone, this occipital bone is remember from inferior view to us what you call the squamous part and also what you call the basilar part. So you find to see that the squamous part and the, the basilar part are uh, intramembranous. Hmm? These ones, yeah, they are intramembranous. But the, the basilar, the basilar specifically is endochondral. Squamous is intramembranous, but this is endochondral ossification. But as you go to the skull base, you find you have the sphenoid, the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone, okay, generally the skull, skull base is formed from sclerotomes of the four occipitosomites. That is origin one. Origin two, paracardial cartilage pairs lateral to cranial part of the notochord. So at birth, generally, the occipital bone, which I told you before, before you go to the skull, the occipital bone, this one, has four parts, divided into four parts. There's the median basiocept, you know, the occipital bone is also called the basiocept. There's the squamous part and two right, two lateral or exo occipital parts, this one. But you happen to see that the squamous part and this other one, so this curve fuses by year three. Hmm? However, the whole bone has to be fused by year six. At first, let me just first give the description. The base is divided into three fossa, the floor of the cranial cavity. So you happen to see that he, this is what you call the anterior cranial fossa, which is bounded by the, okay, okay, generally we have the subriform, cubriform plate here. Then you have what you call the orbital part of the frontal bone. And then there's what you call the crystal gully. Crystal gully, yeah, yeah. Crystal gully. So when you look at the crystal gully, it's an attachment for, for the phallic cerebral, cerebral phallic. Then there's the frontal crest. There's a frontal crest here. Then another thing that is very serious, there is a foramen cecum. Around here, there's a foramen cecum. What passes through foramen cecum? Here passes the mesial veins connecting the nasal cavity to the superior sagittal sinus. And then there passes some olfactory, is it vein? Olfactory, I am not certain. Then on the subform plate, there is olfactory foramen. In the subform plate, allowing olfactory nerve. Then there is anterior and posterior, no anterior and posterior moid sinuses for ismoid vessels. Eh? Then when you happen to go to the middle cranial fossa, this area here, this media here, you have to, have it, you have to see that here. It has some things that make it about it. There's this wing. This wing, I'm not certain. I don't know. Is it the greater? But these are the wings. Eh? Then it has the middle thing called the Ceratus Tachycado, a saddle like bone formation and modified the remainder of the siphonoid bone, for which is a bed of the hypophysial gland or pituitary gland. So for it, it consists of the tubercular cellae. This Tachycado, that tubercular cellae. Is the owner of the saddle, it consists of two anterior kinoid process or bed posts. Then you have what you call the dorsum seri, 
this one is dorsum cell which is consisting of the back the back of this saddle the tachy saddle with posterior superior lateral angles called the posterior clenoid process or bed post then the fossa like a visual foot at the median depression between the depression and cell and the dorsum cell this one is the median depression for pituitary gland it is the seat of the saddle of the pituitary gland is guarded by for bed post, two anterior clinoid or bed post, then these ones also the posterior clinoid processes or bed posts of the dorsum cell. These ones are tubercular cell. You find that there are some opening, for example, there's an opening of intracranial opening of the carotid kidney canal. There's that opening there. There's the ovofolamin. That ovofolamin, ovofolamin, what it allows, it allows passage of the mandibular nerve. Mm -hmm. Then the receptor nerve also passes there. Together with the accessory, accessory meningeal artery and some women's artery. So if this is the ovofolamin, you have what you call the spinous foramen or foramen spine. Ah, ah, spinous foramen. That spinous foramen is the one that allows passage of the middle meningeal artery. So there is what you call the round foramen around there. The round foramen allows the passage of maxillary nerve. There's what we call the tone, tone foramen or lacerated foramen. should be around here. That foramen, the lacerated foramen, it allows for passage of the deep petrosal nerve around here. Deep petrosal but it's generally considered to be a cartilage, yeah? cartilage in nature. There are more foramens. For example, there's hiatus for greater petrosal nerve around somewhere here. there. There's hiatus for lesser petrosal nerve. Let us for lesser petrosal nerves, allow lesser petrosal nerve. Let us for greater petrosal nerves, greater petrosal nerve, and posterior branch of the middle meningeal artery. The posterior branch. Remember, the anterior branch will pass along the area of the terion, craniometric measurement. We happen to see that there will be also a superior orbital fissure, which allows structures of ceramic nerve, cranial nerve 3, cranial nerve 4, cranial nerve 6, sympathetic fibers, there's even superior ophthalmic vein. There's, there's an optic canal which is arranged posterior medially, allows for optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery branch of, uh, I don't know. As you go to the posterior cranial fossa, you have the petrous part of temporal bone and generally the occipital bone. So it has different lines, like this is internal occipital crest, and it has this one here which we call the internal occipital protuberance, IOP, and then groove for transverse sinus. This group for sinus for sigmoid, sigmoid sinuses. Then it has some openings. Eh? That's open. For example, there's this foramen magnum. That largest foramen allows cranial nerve 9, cranial nerve 10, cranial nerve 11, inferior petrosal sinuses, sympathetic tracts, sigmoid sinuses, and then the medullary oblongata, vertebral nerve plexus to row passage for anterior spinal arteries and posterior spinal arteries they will pass there then you find that lateral to it there's there's what you call the hypoglossal somewhere yeah i don't know there has to be hypoglossal hypoglossal canal that allows passage to bring your nerve to a row the meningeal branch of the ascending pharyngeal artery then you happen that to see that uh, that as you go more laterally you have to find the jugular jugular phenomenon the graphonamine will allow passage of the cranial nerve 9, cranial nerve 10, cranial nerve, passage of cranial nerve 11, 11. Hey, a correction has to be made that the mastoid, the following magnum does not allow passage of cranial nerve 9, 10, 11. No, 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 it doesn't. It just allows for medulla, cranial nerve 11 only. Then the vein, anterior spinal artery, the posterior spinal artery, and the medulla oblongata. But, but the jugular foramen is the one that allows for cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, inferior petrosal sinuses, sympathetic, cervical sympathetic tract, cervical sympathetic tract, yeah, cervical sympathetic tract, and then sigmoid sinus. The sigmoid sinus will form the internal jugular vein. This is what you call the kidivas, this area. What you call the kidivas. This area, then there's the jugular tubercle around here. This is the jugular tubercle. The jugular tubercle. Now, if you then decide this, what you call the ascending pharyngeal tubercle. No, there's what you call the pharyngeal tubercle around here for attachment of some pharyngeal muscles, muscles of the pharynx. 
there has to be an opening of the internal hospital internal acoustic meters for passage of the gravitational nerve, vestibular nerve, and the base nerve, and then the mastoid foramen for the passage of meningeal branch of occipital artery and the mastoid emissary vein from sigmoid. Generally, the cephenoid bone has its origin from cephenoid cartilage. You find that pre-cephenoid spree. The post siphenoidal cartilage give rise to the cellar to seek out with its, with its dosum cellar, this one. But as you go on, the remaining part has to develop from the pre siphenoidal cartilage, which give rise to the ala orbitalis and temporalis, ala temporalis, that give rise to the lesser wing, lesser wing, I don't know, I don't know, is it this one? give rise to the lesser wing, to the lesser wing and the part of greater wing. Now the large part of greater wing, the large part of greater wing and some of the medial and lateral trigoid plates have to be formed from intramembranous. So you see the large part of greater wing and together with the medial and lateral trigoid plates intramembranous, but the rest intra in the quantum. So at best your at birth your cephenoid body exists in three parts: the greater wing, the body, and the lesser wing. The body and the lesser wing form the central part, and they unite during the oh, but all of all of the three unite during year one. The siphenoid, siphenoocipital sichondrosis here is the primary cartilaginous joint. It's the cartilaginous joint separating the body of the siphenoid, the body of the siphenoid bone from um, from the occipital bone. Its importance is to provide space for the growing nosopharynx. Eh? Then another I think is to allow backward extension of the arteries as more teeth adapt. That psychondrosis begins to fuse between ages 12 and 14 years and is complete between 20 and 25 years. The temporal bone, this side, this one, the temporal bone here, the temporal bone, that temporal bone is intramembranous and both intramembranous and the bundle. The squamous part and the tympanic part develop from from intermembranous, but the other one from endochondral. So at best, the temporal bone exists in three parts, the petrous part, thyroid post, process, and the united tympanic part. All parts unite during year one, but ascending oscillation center of thyroid process appear at puberty 11 to 16 years.